All right, I am back again with another rangefinder, but you'll find this time it is not an Nikon, it is a Voigtlander. And this is a Voigtlander Vitessa. Uh, it has a designation, I think it's a 125, but I can't quite remember. There are a couple of variations of this camera. Mine has a 50 millimeter F3.5 lens where there are some that have a faster one that I think is an F2.8. Uh, there are later models that have a built-in light meter right here. Uh, unfortunately, there's selenium meters, so by now most of them are dead. And uh, these are cameras that were very popular and common in the 1960s, I believe, uh, from what I recall. Probably should have looked that up before I started this video, but oh well. Uh, and this is an interesting camera to me. This is one of the only cameras I have that's kind of an heirloom or has any sentimental value. This was my grandfather's. He bought this when he was, I think, stationed in Germany in the Air Force back in the 60s. And he used it for a long time, and he kind of passed it on to my mom, and she didn't really use it that much, and she kind of passed it on to me. So it's kind of a family camera that's been around for a while because I, I believe my mom did shoot some really nice photos of me when I was a little kid using this camera. And um, it's something I'd like to keep around because it has you know a bit of a family history and I would like to say a sentimental value. That's probably exaggerating it. I, I don't really feel that attached to the camera, but it is something that is kind of an heirloom to a certain extent. And uh, I've had this camera around for a while and I, I never really used it. And I kept thinking, why haven't I used that camera? And then I get a new Nikon and I'd use that. And I'm thinking, why haven't I used that camera? And I get uh, some other, like a Canon. And I then I'd be like, why haven't I used this camera? And finally I was like, I gotta use this camera. I've had it sitting around for years and I haven't used it. Uh, so I actually took it out a couple of weeks ago and I tried to shoot it and I was very disappointed. Um, immediately I found out the slow shutter speeds don't really work. Um, I don't know exactly where it starts. But um, it's kind of an interesting camera because first of all, say instead of having a film advance lever knob, it has this trigger that you uh, hit and that prepares the shutter. And then you have a little button right here that releases the shutter. Kind of unique, not something you see a whole lot. Seems a bit odd, but I actually really liked it when I was shooting with it. And it also has a, a knob back here that adjusts the focus. And that's something kind of unusual. Not too many cameras have that. And I was kind of dubious about that because it didn't seem like it was going to be great but the, the wheel flows very nicely and it's pretty easy to use. The viewfinder on the other hand it is not great. Um, it has kind of a strange uh, little block in there that does not line up at all. The vertical image does not align. Uh, so it's kind of hard to know if your focus is accurate in some situations and it's not especially bright. Um, I w it's a little on the dim side. It's still visible but it's not especially easy to see. Uh, so that was a a bit of a pain. Uh, but anyways, I put uh, film in it and I tried to start shooting it and then I realized I hadn't set the film counter which is right here and you can really only access that when you open up the camera and you put the film in but then you gotta flip it over here and you gotta adjust that. And I hadn't thought about that so that was a bit frustrating. Um, and I tried to shoot with it and I shot some uh, I shot some photos. I, I was outside and it was a little later and I was using the uh, Ultrafine 100 film which was a little bit slow but with that 100 film and the um, that 3.5 lens I found I, I had to shoot with really low shutter speeds. Uh, and the low shutter speeds on this camera just don't really seem to work. Uh, if you go here, I had it at about 1 60th when I tested it and it seemed to work. But if you go to like 1 15th, it seems okay. but right there if you were listening it, it seemed to kind of catch and it fired a little bit slower if you go to 1 30th let's see what happens sounds pretty accurate but let's go to 1 8th that just seems to me a little slow you can kind of hear the governor spinning in there the little gears in it and it just seems like it's a tad bit slow and I don't know why that's happening it seems to be a common problem from what I've seen on the internet and it can be fixed apparently but I don't know if it's worth fixing it because I don't know if I can really fix it and um, these cameras aren't worth a lot. I've looked them up online, they're only worth about $125. Uh, so if the repair costs much more than 70 bucks, 80 bucks, it's probably not at all worth it. So I just don't know if it's uh, worth fixing and it does seem like the issue is bad enough on the slower shutter speeds, they're not really usable. By the time you get a 125th of, 125th of a second, it seems to be good. 160th seems to be good, but anything beyond that seems to kind of not be so great. Um, there's some other issues. I found it's kind of hard to put the uh, this back on it, like right there. You have to really slide it on and you have to kind of twist that and then it'll it'll trick you. It looks like it's on there but it's not so you gotta do that. The interesting thing is this uh, little rewind knob which is incredibly well built only seems to stick in place if the back is on and if it's kind of loose it flops down like it was doing a second ago. 
I don't know if that's an intentional feature or a flaw, but it is it is an interesting thing to know. You can kind of tell if your back is secure based on where the, um, the little rewind knob is sitting. Uh, you have the little rewind button right there like you see on most more modern cameras. It has an offset uh, screw mount, which I know a lot of people hate, but I don't really care because I don't really use them that much. Um, I wasn't very impressed with the lens because you think since it is on these bellows, uh, it would stretch out quite a bit and you get some really good close focusing and maybe even get like macro type photography. But that's not true. It's uh, minimum focusing distance is somewhere, it, it marks three and a half feet and there's a little dot beyond that and then it goes a little bit further. But it doesn't mark three feet, so I'm, I'm not sure if that dot would be the three foot mark or not. I think if it was, they probably would have marked it as such. But I, I don't know what that is. Maybe that's the effective, the minimum effective focusing distance, which could be like uh, three feet and a few inches, like four inches, five inches, something like that. But I'm not really sure. It does seem to turn after it goes beyond that. So I, I don't know what the minimum effective focusing distance is, but it does not seem like it gets very close. I don't think it even goes down to quite three feet which the most of the Nikon lenses do. Um, I found that kind of strange because this, this is a camera, it's a great what if camera looking at this. Cause you think back in the day, uh, it's very well built in a lot of ways. It looks cool, it's pretty easy to use, but it doesn't seem like they're especially reliable. Um, the film loading is not the easiest in the world. It's not especially hard, but it's not the easiest in the world. I, I will have to say, I tried two rolls of film in this camera and neither of them really came out that good. And one of them just didn't seem to advance after a while. It took like six or seven frames and then it just jammed and didn't advance. And I, I thought I'd fired off a bunch of shots and I rewound it, developed it and saw that, uh, you know, three quarters of the roll hadn't been used. So I was pretty disappointed by that. Uh, one of them seemed to kind of tear the film in there a little bit. It, it's very odd. I don't know exactly what's wrong with the camera. I don't know how common this is. If this is, they're all just kind of shitty like that, or if it's just this camera has been neglected for 30 or 40 years and seriously needs a CLA. It's probably a little bit of both, I would imagine, but I don't know. But it, it is a little bit sad. I can kind of see why Voigtlander was not a, an especially well-known brand at the time, because I can't help but feel if they'd made all these cameras with something like an f2.8 lens, which they easily could have done at that time, I think it would have been it would have been a nice little bonus if they'd made it so the bellows extended out more and you could get more of a macro function. That would have been a really nice bonus if it would have done both of those things. Um, I think it would have been a pretty darn good camera, but it doesn't do either of those things. And yes, there is a faster aperture version of the of the uh, camera lens on other camera models, but they don't seem to be all that common. And I don't know if they're much better. I don't know if they're maybe lacking sharpness or something. Uh, so it is a little bit odd that um, they made this camera and it doesn't really seem to fill much of a niche because you got to think by the time this came out there were very affordable interchangeable lens rangefinders coming out of Japan that would have almost certainly outsold this because they were a lot more useful you had you know even if you had to spend more money going into it you could usually buy the kit with a camera and a lens a lens that, that by the way was much faster than this most of them would have been at least f2s maybe f1.4s or f1.8s in the case of Canon and you probably could have bought that camera and lens for about the same price or a little bit more than this camera. And then you could have purchased other lenses to give it a lot more versatility. So I, I don't know. I mean, you do have the cool form factor of, oh, look, it folds up. It folds up like that, which is kind of neat. But at the same time, even when it's folded up, it's not a whole lot smaller than one of the Japanese rangefinders. And I mean, you have, you know, very high end Leica cameras were coming out around this time. Granted, they were a lot more expensive, but I think a professional would have obviously gone with them or just anybody with the money, I think would have gone with the Leicas. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of a camera that was built without a market. I, I think it's uh, something that a lot of modern camera companies could have learned from because to my knowledge, this is one of the last Voigtlander cameras that was ever produced. Um, it, I don't think it was the last. I know they had the Bessa Flexes and stuff that came out a little later and around the same time, but I don't think those were very popular. Uh, and I don't, I don't think they made a huge variety of lenses for them either. Uh, I could be wrong. I don't know a whole lot about that series, but it is kind of interesting because you have to think that maybe this was a camera that was made on a budget by a company that wasn't doing great or didn't have a lot of market share and I don't think this really helped their case. I think if they'd built a better camera uh, they would have stuck around for a lot longer but they they didn't at the end of the day and it's kind of sad because I was kind of expecting this camera to look nice and you know maybe be a really good portrait camera with a 50 f 3.5 uh, you know I wasn't expecting it to be amazing but I was thinking it'll probably be a good portrait camera maybe I could use this when I get older to ha and have kids to like take nice photos of them but with the uh, with the mechanisms not working that great and with the rangefinder not being that accurate, 
I don't really know if this camera's worth messing around with much, because like I said, it's, it's one of those things where in a sense it's kind of an heirloom, but I, I think I'm the only person who would say that. I think my grandfather would probably be kind of surprised to know I even kept this camera around. He probably figured we, you know, sent it off to Goodwill a long time ago. Um, I might actually ask him about that when I call him next time. See if he remembers this camera and what he thought of it, and uh, if he has any pointers on it. But uh, I, again, it was just, it was something that really disappointed me. I was kind of expecting a little something out of this. I was not expecting it to be a great camera. I know these cameras don't, they're not super popular. They don't really have a great reputation online. But given the, the usability is not amazing, the form factor isn't that great, the lens doesn't seem all that impressive. I could be wrong there. I didn't really get many usable images, so it's really hard to make a judgment call there. But just the usability of the camera and the reliability both seem to be very poor. And I don't know if it's worth it to um, really pursue this camera any further and try to get it fixed. Because like I said, they're pretty common. They're not really worth a whole lot. They don't seem to be widely recognized on the internet. So I, I don't know if I want to put a lot more into it. I'll probably look up a tutorial and see if it's easy to fix it. Maybe do at least one more test roll, but I, I don't think I'm going to um, put a lot of credence in this camera. I kind of hate to do that because, like I said, I, I was expecting it to be something nicer out of the ordinary, but I, I just I found it to be kind of disappointing. So that's my two cents on the uh, Voigtlander, uh, what is it, Vitessa. I was going to call it a Bessa, but the Bessas are the interchangeable lens ones. So um, yeah, a bit of a disappointment. It's also kind of important to note a lot of the more modern Voigtlander stuff that you'll see the Leica M-mount lenses and like the R-series cameras are not made by the traditional Voigtlander in Germany. They're made by the Cosina Camera Company of Japan who purchased the name rights to the company in the late 90s. And they made a lot of cameras. Well, they made a few cameras and a lot of lenses under the Voigtlander name. And they've produced some pretty good stuff. It's been hit or miss. Uh, I know a lot of the lenses are not super sharp or they, they don't have the most beautiful bouquet, but a lot of people like them because they are affordable and they have nice effects and everything. And there's, there's a very large variety of them. And to this day, they're still, they're still stamping out new ones. They just made, a, I think, a 35 millimeter F2 Ultron and I believe a 28 millimeter Ultron that I, I don't know if it was an F2 or an F2.8. I think it was an F2, but I could be wrong. And those seem to get a lot of, uh, they seem to raise a lot of excitement on the internet and people were looking forward to them. Uh, I wouldn't mind having one of those, but I don't really have an M-mount camera to put them on, so it's kind of a null point right now. But uh, the more modern Voigtlander stuff and the older Voigtlander stuff, they're very distinct from one another. Different countries, uh, different aims, I would say, in their, their production. So they really don't have much in common other than that nice, embossed name right there, which does look beautiful. I think they have one of the nicest camera logos. And it's such an interesting name, such a Russian sounding, or I say Russian, I guess it's German, such a German sounding name, kind of Eastern European, I'll go with that. Um, even though I guess technically, yes, Germany's not in Eastern Europe, but I'm getting to that point where I'm rambling about nonsense. So I think it's time to end this video. Uh, so there's my two cents on the Voigtlander and my, uh, my disappointment. One of the few cameras I've really been disappointed in, but such is life sometimes. I might try to give it one more shot, like I said, but I'm not really holding out much hope. So if you see this video like two years from now and there's no follow-up, I would say you can kind of write these cameras off. But, you know, interesting little note in camera history, but I don't think it's much more than that.